afternoon and welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinar Series, our premier digital platform featuring a variety of programs to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when and where you need it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, the Events Manager here at NCIA, and as, as always, I'm very excited to welcome our members and supporters from across the U.S. for another edition of our ongoing NCIA Committee Insight Series today. If you're just joining us, please be aware we'll be conducting Q&A at the conclusion of the presentation. So please pose any questions to the board by pressing that Q&A button along the bottom toolbar within the Zoom platform. Even if you don't have a question to contribute yourself, stop on through that area throughout the session and give an upvote to any questions that you think are particularly worthwhile. And so what are we waiting for? Let's get this show on the road. In case you missed the news, a federal judge in Nevada has recently issued a ruling that calls into question the ability to enforce cannabis-related contracts in federal courts. Today, we're joined by a panel of experts from NCIA's Risk Management and Insurance Committee, as well as INCBA board members to examine how this case compares to other federal and state cases examining this question and what impact these cases may have on how cannabis deal-making gets done, as well as best practices to mitigate the risk of non-enforcement. Thank you to all our NCIA members and INCBA members for joining us this afternoon. And with that, please enjoy today's session entitled NCIA Committee Insights, Enforcing Cannabis-Related Contracts in Federal Court, being moderated by the principal at Horst Legal Counsel, Jason Horst. You've got the room, Jason. Take it away. Hi, all. Thanks so much for joining today. Um, we're going to have an exciting discussion of uh, the enforceability of cannabis contracts and, um, and other cannabis related matters in federal courts. Uh, with me today are uh, two of my favorite colleagues in the industry, Ian Stewart and Katie Young. Um, Ian is the founder and co-chair of the Cannabis and Hemp Law Practice at Wilson Elzer. Um, he is incredibly involved in both of the organizations that are putting on our presentation today, uh, the NCIA, where he serves as policy counsel, and uh, preceded me as the chair of the Risk Management and Insurance Committee. And uh, he serves on the advisory board for the International Cannabis Bar Association. Um, it, there are a few folks who have more to say about uh, Canvas Law than, than Ian, um, and so thrilled to have him today. Um, Katie is the uh, president of the International Cannabis Bar Association and uh, represents both plaintiffs and defendants in a variety of business uh, disputes, real estate claims, intellectual property litigation, and has a unique focus on matters within the cannabis industry. Um, and she is indeed one of the most experienced cannabis focused litigators in the country. Um, so thrilled to have these folks here to, uh, to join me in talking about cannabis, uh, cannabis contract enforcement in federal courts. Uh, my name is Jason Horst. I am the principal of Horst Legal Counsel and uh, have a practice focused in insurance coverage and litigation, uh, primarily in the cannabis industry. And can I, I Jason, th let, let me just, I, I want to, I want to say a couple words about you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, so thank you, by the way, for, that was, that was a nice introduction. Um, Jason, you super, very collaborative uh, friend of mine for the last few years, working particularly with cannabis insurance industry and uh, just couldn't ask for a better uh, partner, uh, kind of Northern California, um, uh, you know, cohort. So we've, we've, together we've covered the state on, on so many things over the last few years. Uh, everything related to cannabis insurance, and uh, great to be on the panel with you, and Katie. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Ian. All right, um, I, I think at this point, I will turn it over to Katie, I believe, to uh, discuss how cases wind up in federal court in the first place. Okay. All right, credit to Ian for this slide here. So there, there are two different court systems in the United States. There's the federal court system and the state court system. And some of them have uh, terminology that's confusing and overlapping. Uh, we wanted to show you, we actually out here in California, we exist in the largest judicial, uh, federal judicial district was the ninth district. 
uh, excuse me, uh, Ninth Circuit rather, it's the circuit courts there. And so we're in kind of the most liberal jurisdiction out here. We also really like the, for cannabis, I'm starting to really like the federal court in uh, Southern District of New York as well, but we'll see. So there's only two ways that you end up in federal court. That's uh, either federal question or diversity jurisdiction. Next slide, please. The thing about contracts is that contracts are state law matters. There's no federal law of contracting. Um, although, so you do end up having a lot of uh, contract disputes in federal court if there's some hook. And so one of those is diversity jurisdiction. Part of the reason the federal courts exist is to try and mitigate against any uh, hometowning advantage or disadvantage that someone might get. If there's litigants that are from two different states, mm -hmm. there's a concern that the state court might be too uh, favorable to the, uh, to the hometown party. Um, so federal court is supposed to mitigate against that uh, for ju diversity jurisdiction, which means that everybody has, everyone involved in the dispute has to be from different states and the amount of controversy has to be over $75,000. Clearly that's an old number. Most controversies are more than $75,000 now. Uh, the other way you get into federal court is on a federal question case. So there is no federal law of contracts, but certainly trademark law is federal. Patent is federal trade. There's lots of federal trade secret laws, federal laws about cyber squatting and other computer crimes, and then federal securities as well. And so you'll see in a lot of contract cases, there's often some other hook. There's also, especially if we're dealing with a, a partnership agreement or you know, breached uh, shareholder agreement, there's some issue with trademarks or trade secrets are often uh, cyber squatting. And so if you have a situation where you have both a state court issue and a federal court issue, you as the, as the disputant, as the one bringing the claim, you get to choose. Where do you want to go? Federal or state court? <clears throat> I had a case once where we were in state court on a breach of contract partnership dispute, but there was also an issue in the case that arose about cyber squatting. And the defendant, instead of filing a counterclaim in the existing state court, went across the street to the federal court in San Francisco, both pictures that are on this slide here. One's the state court, the other one's the federal court. They're catty corner from each other. <laughs> So if you're deciding which way to walk in San Francisco, if you're going to go state or federal, um, the question has to do with uh, you know, how much, and this is something Ian and Jason are getting into later, how much of the dispute turns on the court enforcing the Controlled Substances Act, because we still have to be concerned about the federal courts being subject to the Controlled Substance Act um, guidance that is very unfriendly to cannabis. Uh, so I had this case once where we were in state court on the, so in the state court here on the uh, contract case, and then the defendant, instead of filing a counterclaim in state court, went across the street to the federal court and filed a federal cyber squatting claim. And the federal judge looked at that lawyer and said, I don't know why you would choose to be in my courtroom when you have a forum in the state. Um, you can tell how that one turned out. We'll talk about, that's the Colorado River Stay Doctrine, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, so that's a quick introduction on how we end up in federal court. Uh, you have to intentionally get there. Um, it is not the default choice for contract cases. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jason for a further discussion. Uh, and I will, you know, just volley it over to Ian for a discussion of state versus federal law and how we decide which applies. Sure. Uh, so... You know, I think one question that we all should ask is, well, why, why are we all talking about this? You know, what, what does it matter to everybody on the phone, all you cannabis operators, as to, you know, whether we're in state or federal court? Well, it, you know, Brian in the introduction referred to this, this case that came out in Nevada, and we're going to talk about that in a little while. But even since that case in the last few months, we've seen new cases now that have been following the logic. And it's really important, unlike other industries, when you're in the cannabis industry, you've got to understand what is the, the, the chance that I could be hauled into federal court? And is, the, is this loan agreement, is this lease agreement, is this partnership agreement, is it going to be enforceable in two years um, based on, you know, your state law versus federal law? Well, state law versus federal law, how do the courts decide which law to apply? Well, this is called the Erie Doctrine. That's what's on the screen here. And this comes from a case in 1938. This is a, a case that every law student uh, uh, learns, I'm sure, Katie and Jason, you remember this from years ago? Uh, um, loads. Kind of I'd use loads year law. instead of learns. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, Mr. Tompkins was walking down. You know, he was like a, a you know a, a hobo 
you know, back in the day when we had hobos and walking down the street or uh, uh, along a, a rail line and he got struck by a uh, train and he fell under the train and his arm was severed. And he decided that he was going to, in, in Pennsylvania, he, um, uh, which is where it happened, uh, if he went into the, uh, into the state court, he wouldn't have been able to get compensation. So he, he sued in federal court. Uh, and the federal judges said, well, you know, not so fast. We're not going to allow forum shopping like that. Uh, we're going to apply Pennsylvania state law, even though we're in federal court. And that doctrine has held up very consistently through the years. So in federal court, uh, tip, with a few exceptions, the court is going to apply the substantive law of the state. So if you're in a contract dispute, for example, and you're in federal court, all the procedural rules are going to be federal, but the state law of, uh, you know, in, in what's allowed to be claimed in a contract, what defenses are available under that contract are going to be state laws uh, for the most part, unless it's a federal question, like Katie said. So if it's a misappropriation case under the federal statute or an intellectual property case, for example, those, those federal statutes will apply, but otherwise you're going to apply the state law of the case. And so it's, a, it's an important um, distinction here. And, you know, typically in other industries, people don't necessarily need, need to know this, but in the cannabis industry, it is important to understand this difference so you can proactively help yourself to stay out of federal court if you can. We'll probably bring this up later in, in fact, I'm sure we'll bring this up later in the uh, presentation, but as a, a concrete practice pointer is when you are negotiating contracts for your business, it, don't overlook the section about the choice of law that's going to be applied. And so you'll see at towards the end of pretty much every contract, there's something in there that says, um, uh, this contract is to be construed under the laws of state X, comma, without regard to uh, conflict of law principles, which is specifically in, uh, referring to this Erie Doctrine thing here and saying, if there's a fight about which substantive state law applies, we're going with the state law that we've already decided on. So, uh, you know, California is very, very friendly. Uh, I, especially not only in, in terms of I like the law, but the judiciary is a little more friendly. So if I'm going to be engaging in uh, uh, drafting a contract for someone that's going to be doing business with somebody in, let's say, Oklahoma, <clears throat> I'm going to want to make sure that California state law is the one that applies, even though there might be diversity jurisdiction in a fight later on. Right. And, and, and I guess I, I would piggyback on that by saying, you know, probably, you know, there, there's probably. Entirely, <laughs> it, 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 it is entirely possible that, you know, <laughs> at, at one of the operators that is, or one of the businesses that's, you know, involved in those contractual negotiations if, for a variety of reasons may actually prefer Oklahoma law. But, but, I, but I, I think Katie's point is a really good one that in a state like California, where you have an express statutory provision that says cannabis is a lawful purpose of contracting, um, you know, that, that, that is going to be helpful, uh, you know, at the end of the day, because a lot of this is going to be federal courts applying state law, um, though e even that gets tricky. All right, advance the slide, I think. All Jason, right. talk and to us about enforcing <laughs> illegal contracts, even in federal yeah. court. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even in federal court, um, so so yeah. So as you know, we've been hinting around, and I know it's going to blow everybody's mind here. Um, cannabis is illegal under federal law, and uh, so you know, contracting around the production, uh, distribution, sale of cannabis is uh, is fraught when you're in federal court, and. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has, you know, it, so we're talking now about the backdrop of federal law that, that we sort of, we walk in with, uh, you know, and one of the issues is that the U.S. Supreme Court has said, quote, illegal promises will not be enforced in uh, cases controlled by federal law, and that it's well established that a federal court has a duty to determine whether a contract violates federal law before it enforces it. So, I, I sense a big butt coming up here, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> is, 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 is that on the slide? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you well, underlined I, your butt. <laughs> yes, I, 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 often, I often do. Um, so, 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 yeah, so contracts that are entered into, um, you know, as I say, to, you know, to facilitate the production, distribution, and sale of cannabis, uh, being illegal in the eyes of federal law, 
you know, it, we've got a problem here. And you know, with the US Supreme Court saying that courts must look at this issue. Um, but the reality is that, you know, out, even outside the, co the context of cannabis, federal courts have somewhat shrugged off, you know, this statement by the, the Supreme Court um, as an absolute and do take a more nuanced approach. And there's a case out of um, the Ninth Circuit in 2005 that, you know, cites the need to also take into account the windfalls that might be created, forfeitures that might happen, um, and what the parties, you know, what they say, relative moral culp culpability. So, you know, it, who's really at fault here? Um, and courts take these issues into account in deciding whether or not they're going to enforce an illegal contract, even if they have found that it is indeed an illegal contract. Um, and, and one of the points I, I want to make as well, it's not in the slides, um, but there is an issue created by the supremacy clause in the constitution um, that some of the courts and cases that we've discussed have, uh, you know, ha have raised where whatever state law may say, if there is federal law that if the federal government has come in and said under our power to govern a variety of types of uh, of matters uh, and don't want to get too deep into in, in federal constitutional law, this is, United States law is supreme and it is the supreme law of the land. And so it's going to trump state law. And arguably this includes cannabis because the Controlled Substances Act does step into this space. And, uh, and so that, that's going to be a factor that, that you need to consider as well. Um, one last point here is severability and severability is essentially the, the concept that you can carve out a problematic provision in your contract and enforce the rest of it and a lot of contracts in in fact include a severability clause within them that expressly says if a if a particular provision is stricken the rest of this contract is still enforceable yeah um and you know and that is definitely a good thing to, to include in your contracts, um, especially in this industry. And Jason, can, um, I, can I add one, one thing there, if you don't mind? Only um, one. For, se for severability, it's really important to um, treat this state by state because some states are going to say, okay, you can have a, you can have a severable, uh, unenforceable or illegal provision that we can carve out of that agreement and then enforce the rest of the agreement as if it never happened. Whereas right. other states will say, wait a minute, you've got an unenforceable legal agreement in here. And if it's, if it's a material term to the overall contract, they're not going to enforce the entire contract. So there's different sort of levels of severability and it varies by state. So it's really important to look at that before you choose which state you want to do. Because, you know, this comes up again and again in ca cannabis contracting when, when, you, when you go to court to try to enforce it. And that's absolutely right. Yeah. Why don't you, uh, why don't you keep going? Uh, sure. Okay, so uh, we mentioned early on that there is this case in Nevada, and it's here on the screen, called Bart Street 3 versus ACC Enterprises. And that was from April, uh, which seems like forever ago. <laughs> now, uh, you know, the pandemic had already started by then. Um, and it, this is a contract case that involved a, a multi-million dollar loan agreement uh, for expansion of a cultivation facility in Nevada. Uh, and the issue was there were, there were two problematic, uh, from the court's perspective, problematic terms within this loan. One was that um, th th there was, a, it was, some of the loans were speci was specifically earmarked uh, toward um, uh, production, toward, toward uh, uh, the actual operations uh, of the cultivation. Um, and then there was also a right of first refusal where the, where the lender had the right to take some equity uh, in, in, in the business. And the court said that both of those provisions made the contract unenforceable because each one, if the court said, okay, after this, dis this dispute happened, if the court said, yeah, I'm gonna enforce this contract, that means the court was basically saying, I'm gonna mandate that one of the parties violate the Controlled Substance Act. And as a federal judge, I can't mandate violations of the Controlled Substance Act. The question then becomes, well, okay, that was a plant touching you know, loan involving actual marijuana operations. What about for ancillary services or ancillary products? How far back do we have to go 
before that line is drawn where, you know, courts are going to start to enforce. And, and Jason will have some examples of, of where that happens. But well, and I'm yeah. curious, Ian, do, do you do you agree that the court would have had to order a violation of the CSA there? Well, you know, um, I think they would, yeah, because, you know, what, what they were saying was that, you know, they were asking for profits and they were asking for, for basically, um, you know, uh, the right to proceed with cultivation activities that result in money derived and profits to that party. And so that would be a direct violation yeah. of the Controlled Substance Act. So, yes, I, I, I mean, I agree with the underlying uh, logic. I don't necessarily right. agree with the result, I guess. Right. No, right. Yeah. But, um, and then after the Bart Street case, we've, we've had two other cases. So that was a Nevada case. Now we have a, a case in Oregon and a case in Washington. These are both similar. They're breach of contract disputes where, again, you're, you're fighting over profits that um, in a similar way are derived from uh, cannabis operations and the courts for, you know, very similar reasons said now we're not going to enforce these agreements. And so this has sort of thrown, you know, things into a little bit of a tizzy over the last few months because, um, you know, now we have three um, district courts, um, all within the Ninth Circuit, um, that are, uh, you know, not enforcing contracts. This is a bad bellwether, yeah. uh, the proverbial yeah. canary in the mine, because mm -hmm. the Ninth Circuit is generally regarded as the most liberal on these policies. And if we were to choose know where to bring a challenge it would probably be the ninth circuit so pretty disheartening to see these this like triple punch right here let's mm -hmm. blame it on the pandemic yeah. jason give us some better news <laughs> it's, 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 now, now, now that ian's brought us all down i'll try to pick you back up by uh, oh. letting you know that <laughs> a number of courts have enforced cannabis related contracts um you know, and as Ian foreshadowed, you know, it, 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 these courts are generally not being asked to order a violation of the CSA. Um, and, and that fact is, you know, particularly relevant to their analysis. Um, if we can, uh, sorry, we are on the right slide. Um, so as a guy who does a lot of insurance coverage work, my personal favorite is Green Earth Wellness Center versus uh, Attain Specialty Insurance. And here, you know, you've got an insurer who knowingly covers a cannabis grow operation and um, then they have you know some significant fire damage and the insurer comes in and says you know i don't know your honor if you can enforce this policy at all i don't know if we can pay out any you know you know we, we can pay anything out to our insured um because there's this federal illegality thing and um so the, the court indeed did enforce the ins the insurance policy and um, had the payer the carrier pay out under it to repair the grow facility. Um, and the court there says, you know, in, any judgments issued by this court will be recompensed to Green Earth based on Attain's failure to honor its contractual promises, not in, in not an in instruction to Attain to pay damages to marijuana plants and products, pay for damages to marijuana plants and products. So again, the, the lack of a need to order a violation of the CSA is, is, is highly relevant there. And I think it's also helpful to, you know, any litigators out there who are dealing with these issues in federal courts is to you know to really draw that distinction what, what exactly is the court being ordered to do what's it based on and um and is there functionally any direct violation of the csa that the court is ordering and, and here and, it is and, not and jason sorry and also I mean, moral culpability right so um it, it, a team knew that they had right. underwritten cannabis activities you know, um, you're, then, you're, 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 you're jumping ahead, man. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I, I just had to throw in, one of my partners calls this the Nana Nana Boo Boo defense, where they say, sorry, you know, <laughs> sorry, you know, it's too bad, so yeah. sad. Yeah, yeah no, I, and, and, and no doubt. I mean, and I think actually a much more significant factor for the court was the fact that Attain is doing this knowingly and that, you know, that you can't, you know, collect premiums 
and get all of the benefits of the contract you entered into. And then when all of a sudden, you know, especially in the context of an insurance contract, you know, the insurer doesn't take the, the downside until there's a claim. You can't come now when there's a claim, you've gotten all the benefits of the contract and say, I don't know, you know? And so, yes, I, I do think that was a much bigger consideration for the court. Um, in, you know, in a case out of uh, mine in uh, Katie's home district of the Northern District of California, um, you know, Man versus Gullickson, the court re relies in significant part in, on Green Earth Wellness and, um, and the discussion about whether or not they are going to have to order a, um, you know, a violation of the CSA in finding that they could enforce a promissory note relating to the sale of shares in the business that provides ancillary goods um, and services to cannabis companies. Uh, but again, there's, there's no order to require anyone to possess, cultivate, or distribute cannabis. Um, in a case out of the Northern District of Texas, Ginsburg versus ICC Holdings, it reaches essentially the same conclusion uh, with regard to another policy, uh, promissory note uh, as the court in man. Um, Jason, I'd like to point out the, um, the timing on all those. On your last slide there, there's two cases from 2016 yeah. and one from 2017. Um, now the first breach of contract case that I handled for a cannabis business was in the fall of 2015. So mm -hmm. that, that's how new all of this mm -hmm. is, is that, there, that you're not going to find yeah. any cases that are a whole lot older than 2016. Um, so no, that's right. I, I, I mean, I think the man case came out, you know, the same week that California was um, you know, voted in adult use. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. So, that yeah. was two I, days I, before the election. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, oh, those heady days. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have another one of those coming up. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so I, there's, and if we can flip to the next slide, um, you know, I want to say that, that these cases are not contract cases, um, but they are, you know, additional cases that you know, show again that you know, courts are going to going to be inclined to rule on disputes between parties where they're not going to be required to. Um, to order violations of the CSA. Um, that's true in Kenny versus Helix, uh, where the Tenth Circuit finds that, you know, cannabis security company is going to be subject to the Fair Labor, Labor Standards Act. Um, uh, in SIVA Enterprises versus Ott, um, where the Central District of California finds that, you know, a, a case that's brought under a federal mis a misappropriation statute can proceed uh, because the dispute did not involve any you know, actual production or sale of cannabis, but rather, um, you know, the actions of the defendants in misappropriating uh, a lot of trade secret and confidential information. Um, and, and I wonder, Ian, you know, being that you were the one that, uh, you know, came in and uh, took names and whatnot uh, in that case, whether there's any particular insights you might want to share. Well, so th this was a fairly early case as well, and we didn't have a lot of, um, you know, some of the subsequent case law that, in, 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 that, that distinguished the sort of dichotomy we're talking about, about the ancillary services mm -hmm. versus plant touching, which would have been helpful <laughs> in that case. Yeah, um, no doubt. But, you know, we, we made a conscious decision. We wanted to take advantage of the federal misappropriation statute, which is a powerful statute. Um, and so we decided we're going to file in, in federal court and, and have that fight and, and see where it goes. And so uh, we, were, we, were, we were glad we did. But it, it, you know, awesome. it, it, was, it was a battle. Yeah. I love, I love having a, a plaintiff that's willing to push the limits on this and be willing to know that, you know, so much of this is untested. A lot of these cases end up being cases of first impression. And it takes brave plaintiffs and brave lawyers to do the analysis and then make a conscious decision to go into a case knowing that you're going to be making new law. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're, we're writing the law in this area still. And um, yeehaw, pew pew. Yeehaw, exactly. <laughs> Pioneers. Um, and, and, and so, you know, these other cases fall, you know, fall in the similar, uh, you know, trajectory. Um, you know, and, 
in, in each of them, there's, there's certainly relevance to the question of whether or not the court is going to have to order a violation of the CSA. Um, I, I, I do want to throw out there though that I, I think, however the, the courts discuss these matters and their reasoning, it, it seems to me that they're much more easily reconciled um, where the CSA, ordering the CSA violation is a more limited factor than they acknowledge and that the desire to avoid windfalls or, you know, unjust enrichment as uh, we lawyers like to, to talk about um, is, is much more of a driving force in these decisions. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, you know, going back to the green earth case, I think it's a good example of that because that, that case declined to follow several other insurance related cases in the cannabis context where there had been claims on policies that were not reasonably written in anticipation of covering cannabis losses. Um, because, you know, as, as Katie said, this is all new, right? I mean, it, the mm -hmm. widespread nationwide legalization is new. And so it, it is a new thing to have a situation where it, something goes wrong in a context where stuff goes wrong all the time, but now there's a cannabis angle to it. And there's a complicating factor that state law says cannabis is okay. And, and so where, you know, someone like an insurer is not anticipating paying for marijuana plants that are, you know, in a house that gets burned down, that's a different thing than an insurer who's covering a grow facility knowingly and willingly and collecting premiums based on cannabis profits. Right. And, and so I, I think that, you know, candidly that places, you know, Bart street and it's, you know, it's recent prodigy in, in some question and because it's not really reconcilable with the way that these cases have been decided in the past. And it actually cites to some of these cases that were rejected by yeah. Green Earth Wellness in later cases. Um, and and I, I do think that, you know, w hopefully when these cases get appealed um, and it will be up to the Ninth Circuit, uh, it, you know, that that is something that is really driven home is it, you have to look at what the practical effect of these types of you know of decisions are going to be and and we really do you know want to not have parties you know not be able to rely on contracts in this industry it would be, it would be pretty catastrophic if that yeah. was lost well well jason i think i think it's important to understand that uh in federal court you know federal judges sort of uh, as a this is a general generalization, but I think you both agree with it. Federal judges um, uh, are different than state judges. <laughs> yeah. um, as a general rule, federal judges are going to be very. Um, they're going to pay a lot of, uh, of attention to the detail. They've got clerks that are going to do the research. They're not going to miss relevant precedent, um, and they're going to try to make the right ruling, uh, realizing that everybody's human. Um, so you know to the extent that there is now this, this precedent out there and they're bound by this sort of logic, um, you know, that I think that's going to continue going forward until there's a change at the federal level. But, you know, they're also going to, you know, try to be fair. And to the extent that there are equitable defenses, um, unjust enrichment or others, um, you know, or if it's severable, you know, um, I think the judges will apply the law. Uh, in state mm -hmm. court, you, you get what you get. You, get. you can get a good judge, you can get a bad judge, you know, sometimes they split the baby, yeah. sometimes they don't get all the research done. You know, certainly it depends on, you know, which state you are, which county you're in, you know, are they elected or are they appointed? You know, it's just, it's a, you know, it's, it's a gamble. So, um, so many considerations. And, and, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and sometimes they're going to throw their hands up and they're going to say, you know what, this shouldn't be in federal court at all. Ian, can you tell us about that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jason. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Federal abstention. There we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice segue. Uh, Right. So this is um, uh, a doctrine that uh, was recently raised in this case, Left Coast Ventures. And, and we, we threw it in here because um, it's a really interesting um, argument that the, that the court used to avoid rulings on, on, on the substantive issues. 
And we really haven't seen the, the federal abstention doctrine being used in the context of cannabis uh, by other courts. But, you know, frankly, um, it probably should be looked at more closely. And if you're a lawyer litig litigating these cases, you may want to use this as a tool in your arsenal. Um, so in Left Coast Ventures, this is a, um, uh, it's a, it's a contract dispute. Um, and, and the court said, the federal court said, look, we're not going to wait in. We're going to, we're going to abstain from ruling. And the reason that they're going to abstain is because um, of what they call the Colorado River Doctrine. So 1976 is when this, this the doctrine was really sort of uh, uh, vocalized by the U.S. Supreme Court. And it's where there's uh, difficult questions of state law bearing on policy problems of substantial public import, where it's really better for the state to, uh, through judicial reasoning and policy uh, uh, decision making, the state is in a better position than a federal court to come in and say what should be legal and what should not be. Um, and I, I really like this, this last paragraph here. The, the court in Left Coast Ventures uh, said that they were not invalidate the contract because it might create disincentives for businesses to comply with state cannabis regulations by rendering their contracts unenforceable in federal court, which is exactly what we're talking about here. It creates this, you know, especially if the 10th circuit or the fifth circuit take these different positions. Now we've got a patchwork, not unlike what we're seeing with CBD and the, and the FDA, you know, and where the, where, where federal courts are also saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, we're not going to, you know, we're going to stay these litigation and let the FDA do its work because we don't want all this chaos. Right. And this is exactly, the reasoning. So hopefully we'll see more of this. Uh, I have one more uh, comment about this. So I mentioned earlier on, on the first slide that we had a case where uh, we were in federal, we were in state court on the contract and then the defendant went into federal court on a cyber squatting issue. Um, and I, I gave you the story about how the judge came out and said, I don't know why you want to be in my court. That was in the context of a hearing on a Colorado River stay motion because we were already far down the line in state court. We were coming to the end of discovery um, and so the idea of having a separate lawsuit in federal court is not only the concept of judicial waste and just waste in general, um, but also, you know, the, the judge's comment was motivated not so much by, you know, not, it actually wasn't as motivated by the cannabis subject as it would be, as it was by the fact that we were already way down the line in this other case. And because personally, speaking with uh, some of the judges that uh, are at the Northern District of California, which is one of the most liberal federal courts. Um, and I know a lot of these folks personally through networking groups and such, and their personal thoughts about cannabis are such that it would not affect their decision-making if they were to have a cannabis case come across their docket. That's fine with them. But there was this little piece about like, well, why are you even here? If you have a choice between state and federal and you're already way down the line in state, please don't come to my courtroom. And so the stay room, the, the stay motion was indeed granted. Um, but what a waste of resources for absolutely everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Courts don't like mm. having their time wasted. Nobody likes having their time wasted. Oh my goodness. All right. So let's, <laughs> so we're, we've been talking a lot about, um, I think without saying it specifically, and you know, Jason was talking about, you know, to the extent that the enforcement is going to require violation of the CSA, that's when we really get into problems here. Uh, I think what ultimately we're discussing is that there's this long spectrum of disputes that exist in the cannabis industry. On one hand, those disputes that, you know, require, the involvement of the Controlled Substances Act, but on the other side of the spectrum, there's things that don't involve the Controlled Substances Act hardly almost at all. For instance, if someone was injured at a, you know, a facility, of course the court's gonna hear that case. It doesn't matter that they were injured at a, at a cannabis facility. Um, one way you're always gonna be able to get into federal court is with some intellectual property work, uh, trademarks and copyright, patents and trade secrets all have federal statutes. There's some very interesting litigation going on right now involving um, state trademarks versus federal trademarks. Um, so quick primer, because trademark law is federal, mostly governed by the Lanham Act, which is a federal act, uh, it is generally not the case that if you are a business owner, you're not able to get a trademark for the good cannabis. Trademarks covers goods and services. You can't get a trademark for cannabis, but in the state of California, you can get a trademark for cannabis. And so now there's all these big fights amongst state trademark holders versus federal trademark holders. Um, our office has handled lots of these. And you know, there, there's an issue where you probably, if I, if I were to choose where to go, 
I kind of feel like federal court's the better one for trademark law because federal courts have more of an understanding of trademark law. Whereas although California, for instance, because that's where I am, has had this California trademark system for a long time, there's not a whole lot of case law or litigation about it because it was never a particularly useful or interesting uh, topic to be involved in. But now all of a sudden that we can have trademarks for cannabis in California, there's huge disputes with the federal trademarks. And I've noticed that some state court judges just don't understand trademark the way that federal judges do. So that might be, uh, you know, one of the rare instances where you would choose a federal court over the state court. Um, that, that, I'm not that, as that understanding that federal courts have, though, doesn't necessarily inure to the benefit of of a lot of cannabis operators. That, well, know, that, I, that is true. What Jason's talking about <laughs> is the very unfavorable ruling that the industry suffered in the case that's uh, Kiva, Kiva versus Kiva. Um, Ian and I are going to be speaking on a webinar in a week with the lead counsel on that case as well. There was a, a very unfortunate ruling from the federal court in San Francisco. Again, unfortunately, some of the most liberal judges out there, we got this real shit stick of a ruling, which said something <laughs> like uh, no, trademark. <laughs> I think that's the technical term. Uh, something like uh, tra you know, trademark holders are not. Show. Right. Trademark holders are not going to be able to rely on uh, use of their mark before 2018 because cannabis was not fully legal in California until 2018. So basically saying nobody's going to be able to point back to all these federal registrations that they've had for hats and yoga services and informational websites and things. It's not going to establish trademark rights for the, uh, applying that mark to the good cannabis going forward. So it was a huge deep blow for folks and we're all still kind of dealing with you know, just beginning to figure out what that is going to mean for the industry going forward. Um, and I mean, I think it, it's going, it really is going to have a lot of shockwaves, not only in cases between companies, but in, you know, the partnership disputes and a variety of contexts is going to be, there's going to be a lot of fallout from that. And um, regardless of how we characterize it, you know, it, it, it was, uh, it came down from, from Judge Breyer who, um, you know, I think not only because of his uh, his brother is uh, you know, is a pretty well renowned um, district court judge, and I I anticipate that its reasoning is going to be upheld and followed. Um, I don't know what you guys think about that, but I, I think it's not it is not great news for the industry as a whole. No, and it's going to be a long time before we get away from that, and it's going to have to be a very well funded, very brave party who will mm -hmm. challenge yeah. that ruling. And I mean, yeah. it cannot be said enough, folks. These, these rulings do not change unless industry participants who are experiencing litigation have a litigation fund enough and a knowledgeable lawyer enough to go forward and bring these things to a court order or a verdict. That's how we're making new law. This doesn't change unless we change it, which means somebody has to be the guinea pig. Um, so patents are also completely f uh, federal law. There's two kinds of patents. There's one kind of patent where you have to send a sample of your product to the federal government. You can't do that for cannabis. And yet people still send weed to the federal government. Don't do it. Don't do it. Please engage a very knowledgeable patent lawyer. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then trade secrets. So Ian, I'm actually going to turn trade secrets over to you because this was your SIVA case. I mean, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. So well... So trade secrets is a is a, a, a area of litigation that can be difficult because you know people try to describe what a trade secret is in different ways. But d generally speaking, under both the federal statute and the California statute, and this is similar in other states too, a trade secret is a is a is a is a secret, meaning that there's you know it has value to you, um, whether it's some you know uh, uh, it can be you know uh, identity of certain clients, it can be you know, the way that you do things in, in business, it can be certain spreadsheets that have value to you, but you have to have it secret. You have to take action to maintain that secrecy. Uh, and then there has to be a kind of a misappropriation, you know, some wrongful act where the person is, has taken it either stolen it or they've used some deception or whatever. And, 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 and then and it has to cause damage. Um, and so a lot of the, the litigation around trade secrets is whether or not it's actually a trade secret in the first place. You know, so, so um, that's, that's a big battle. But if it is a trade secret uh, and it's been misappropriated and there's damage, then they're standing. And, and um, uh, you know, certainly the, the, the federal statute is a very strong, you know, powerful statute. Um, uh, 
and you know, I, I expect that as we as we see more um, consolidation in the industry, um, we're going to see more of this type of litigation in cannabis for sure. And it's the same as you know other other industries that have that have um, you know grown quickly. We saw a lot of trade secrets coming out of you know the dot coms. Uh, you know, we've seen trade secrets in um, you know the kind of uh, medical device you know litigation and 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 you know so as as new technologies come online, you get trade secret litigation. Next slide. Um, so, so uh, you know, the, the next question I think is what companies can do, you know, before the fact, as, as Katie mentioned earlier in the presentation and, and teed up uh, this moment here. Uh, you know, what what can we do, you know, as lawyers and as conscientious uh, operators to make sure that our contracts are going to be enforced when you know they eventually end up in federal court. Um, or, you know, potentially prevent them from ending up in federal court. Oh. I can't remember. Oh, oh, let's, oh. Go, let's go back. Yeah, uh, I guess that, that was me. Yeah. All right. And I know we're running out of time here, so we'll go pretty fast. So we mentioned, I'm going to drop down number three here, uh, form selection and choice of law cannot be overstated at the outset of negotiating your contracts, especially if you're, most importantly, if you're contracting with someone that's outside of your state, a company outside of your state, just very tricky business in the cannabis world. Uh, focus on that forum selection clause. Get, uh, get some clarity on what the substantive law of the state means. Like for instance, if we're talking about an employment contract, uh, any non, most non-competes are unenforceable in California. Uh, but if you're being hired by a company that's out of, let's say Delaware, um, there's, uh, you know, it might be a more enforceable non-compete. And so there, there are real substantive rights that are at issue that are affected by the form selection clause. So do not let that go by as something that's just a part of your form contract. Um, you can also contract with each other to agree at the beginning that nobody will attempt to remove to federal court. Um, my very first case in, in cannabis was this uh, fall of 2015 contract between a California business and a Maryland business. Uh, my client definitely screwed up. We offered a settlement. Maryland business said, no, nope, it's not enough. We're going to file in federal court. And I said, okay, well, I'll remove to, uh, they said, well, file in state court. And I said, that's fine. I'll remove to federal court. And he clutched his pearls and said, <laughs> you would not. And I said, well, what am I going to do not. here, buddy? <laughs> Yeah, uh, we settled. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers do have a duty to zealously <laughs> represent our clients. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and I realized, by the way, I apologize, that awkward silence there was uh, because I queued up uh, the next uh, you know, talking point and I was supposed to talk on it. Yep. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so, so you, you, you do want to look at things like, whether cannabis is um, a legal object of contract under state law as it is expressed in California, or if it's more murky in um, the other jurisdictions that, you know, it, that might be a possible option for choice of law. Um, you, you also need to really consider um, as you, especially as you're filing a case, um, and you know, also as you are looking for defenses, how the law has changed over time, cannabis regulations and what's legal and what's not in a given state um, have been changing constantly, you know, even intrastate in states across the country over the last five years and or six years. And um, that can have significant impacts on the viability of different claims. Uh, so I definitely pay attention to that issue. And yeah, J Jason, can I, can I make a comment on that? And I think yeah, of course. Things. And so for like legacy operators, you know, been around a long time yeah. or people who may be, you know, entering into a new, new um, ge geography, it's important to like look at your contracts. And if you haven't incorporated later, later changes to the law, you can do it by endorsement. It's really easy or an amendment, you know, and just, just tack it on as an exhibit to an existing contract or just, you know, sign a new contract. But, but th th this has been a problem uh, with several, cases now uh, where, where courts have said, oh, geez, you know, the parties didn't uh, exhibit that intent within the four corners of the document. Therefore, we're not, we're not going to enforce it. You're assuming there's a contract, Ian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I, I, one, one thing I did want to add as well on this topic is you, you, if you are an investor or representing an investor, 
um, in the cannabis space right now in light of some of these cases that have come down. Um, I, you know, I, I think these are things that you want to look long and hard at and look at what jurisdictions you want to be investing in at, you know, at this moment, because if you are safer if you are an investor and you are investing in someone within your own state, you know, a company within your own state, because it is harder to get, it is harder to obtain diversity jurisdiction. And so, you know, if you, and when you're on the investment side, you know, the risk is, and it's, ha it's what's happening in some of these cases, you're going to lose your investment entirely by virtue of the fact that you can't enforce the contract in court. And so I think, I think that constituency has to be particularly careful in light of some of these recent decisions. I don't know what you guys think, but um, it strikes me that that's something folks have to have to be cognizant of. Sure. Jason, have, we, oh, sorry, Katie, go ahead. I had one more small point to make on this particular uh, slide before we move on. I know we're, we're short on time. And that is, so not only this, the state's choice of law, but this forum selection clause idea, you can even choose in a contract at the head of, uh, ahead of time, which specific court you all agree to go to as well. And that makes a big difference. Even within the state of California, where all of us practice, there's 300, and there's what, how many counties? I don't remember, yeah. 58 counties or something like that. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it matters where you go. Because uh, it's regulation of cannabis is hyper local, county by county. And so you generally want to go to a county that has more commercial cannabis activity so that the judiciary understands more about what the what the nature of the industry looks like. Because it's very it's very difficult to deal with, you know, educating judges who don't understand the first thing about the first thing. They don't have, you know, 200 years of experience judging auto industry contracts, right? It's not the same anymore. So right. you're really be getting really hyper-local on where you go to have that forum for your dispute. Sure. Yeah. All right, let's, let's hit that That's last slide. Point. And Ian, did you want to say yeah. something else? No, well, we, we, we do have a question from Gary, but uh, let's go ahead and hit the last slide and then we can yeah. cover it. Okay, so uh, any discussion like this has to end with the idea of alternative dispute resolution which is avoiding court altogether, if you can. Um, and that's especially important for our industry because of, you know, we're so highly regulated and, you know, depending on where you are and what the regulations say, if you have to sue someone or get sued, um, there may be some disclosure requirements that you have to fulfill to, you know, let your regulators know uh, what's going on with you. And you probably need to let your investors know and your business partners and all that sort of thing. So probably want to stay away from court uh, if, unless absolutely necessary. I'm a litigator. I've been a litigator for 11 years and I will tell everyone freely litigation should be the absolute last resort. You should do everything you can to stay out of the court system. We, we kind of gave a little preview about how unreliable state court judges are. Uh, you know, oftentimes clients will come to me and say, oh, I've got such a slam dunk case. And I'm like, you know what? There's no such thing as a slam dunk. And even if there were, it still depends on what the judge ate for breakfast that morning. Yes. Yes, very much so. So how do we avoid putting our fate in the hands of a judge who may, may or may not have eaten her Wheaties that morning? So one thing to do is when, <laughs> when you are negotiating your contract at the beginning, I know it's difficult to think about all the different ways that this business relationship is going to go up in flames and become a disgusting dumpster fire, but you do need to think about those things ahead of time. And one way, one way to do it would be to say, okay, now, given the nature of who we are, uh, parties to contract. Hopefully you know a little bit about this company that you're contracting with. Um, maybe you have a discussion about, okay, if we have a dispute, then you know, one of us has to send the other person an email. We have to have an initial meeting of the principals within 30 days or so to try and work it out. You can write that into the contract. That's a pretty soft, like try and work this out before we go to court sort of thing. Or you can have something that's a little more a little more teeth that says we'll try non-binding mediation. Of course, all mediations are non-binding. No mediator has the power, but you can go to a mediation um, and you know, cases only settle at mediation if, if both parties have had enough time and information to understand their risks and rewards of continuing with the dispute. So I like to put in clauses in contracts that say that we will do a mandatory mediation within like six months of the dispute because it generally does take that much time for everyone to exchange some information with each other, research the law, write a decent mediation brief, talk to witnesses and show up ready to actually resolve something. Um, and I like to have people add uh, what I call teeth 
to contracts like this. You can say, um, in the event of a dispute, there has to be a pre-litigation mediation. And if either party fails to participate in mediation, then even if that party later prevails in court, they don't get their attorney's fees. So we want to be able to, you know, have some stick to try and make the other side come to the mediation. Because oftentimes, by the time we're, by the time we're thinking about filing a complaint in federal court, there is so much hatred and vitriol on both sides that it ends up being pretty difficult to even get the parties to trust each other to spend a day to sit with a mediator to try and resolve something. Now, not only no, no idea that they're actually going to resolve it, but to, to trust each other enough to give it the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other consideration is to um, waive court litigation altogether and have everyone agree to arbitrations where you hire a private judge who's either served as a judge or as a, a very experienced uh, litigator um, who joins the panel. And the benefits of arbitration is that it's much more private, um, not that that information never gets out, it still can, um, but arbitration can be a lot more expensive. Sometimes it moves faster. Uh, but, you know, there may be some real concerns about your particular business or the, the subject matter of this particular contract that you're negotiating, where you'd really want it to be an arbitration to keep it away from the regulators, the media. It depends on what's going on. Yep. And you can have yep. limited appellate rights sometimes with arbitration. Yes, right. very right. limited appellate rights. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, well, and, and, and you can, well, I, I, I would say I mean, one thing you can do as well is you can limit the power of the arbitrator to yeah. to rule on the basis of federal illegality, right? I, I mean, so one of the things you can put in expressly, you know, before the parties know which side is going to benefit is we're not going to play this game, you know, and, you know, the, the, and sort of render our entire panel moot, um, which is definitely something that I, I generally recommend in the context of Canvas contracts. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that was our last slide. And yeah. then we have a question from we have a question. Gary. Uh, actually, let's advance the slides real quick. So Gary, Gary, wonder, Gary Weinstein, thanks for your question, um, wonders, if a client provides non-plant touching ancillary services, think remote such as providing marketing materials and services, to a marijuana company, does the client need to be concerned about liability for supp supplying goods to a company that is in a business that is federally illegal? And if so, what is the best way to draft the contract to protect the client? Uh, I got a couple thoughts on this. Um, so I, I think we have to kind of divorce two, two ideas. Um, so first of all, any, any party uh, whether you're plant touching or ancillary that's operating in or around the cannabis industry must go in with open eyes and, you know, realize that, you know, we have schedule one and, and there's no, there's no protection, uh, you know, there, there's no protection and, you know, it, it can be considered a criminal conspiracy, no matter how far down the chain you are. Now, uh, the real question is what's the likelihood of enforcement by a, you know, federal criminal, uh, you know, enforced enforcement agency like the DOJ or DEA, and the and the the answer is very very little. You know, it, not that there's no risk, but the risk is you know very 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 small, especially if you're operating consistently with with state law. So you've got you know the federal courts treat things differently than the federal agencies. The federal agencies like the DOJ are going to look to re well regulated state laws, and even though the Cole memo is history. Uh, for purposes of the DOJ enforcement, it really isn't, uh, you know, most prosecutors are still looking to that. And so therefore, you know, that's the kind of uh, uh, assessment you have to do. That's different than the federal courts. The federal courts mm -hmm. are applying the law. They're not looking at necessarily, especially if you're in a contract dispute, they're not looking at criminal enforcement. They're looking at, you know, civil tort liability, civil contract liability, civil li or, you know, mm -hmm. liability under, under statutes. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that, you know, we, we have to treat that a little bit differently in terms of, uh, uh, you know, con contract protections. I don't know, Katie and Jason, if you have thoughts about, about that part. I, I mean, I think it's some of the stuff we just said, and I would say have, have man versus Gullickson in your pocket, uh, the, the case I mentioned earlier, because that's basically this case. Yeah. Um, I spotted one other little issue with Gary's question, which actually isn't a little issue, and that is uh, specifically for providing marketing materials and services. Uh, there's a huge aspect of the uh, commercial cannabis regulations that have to do with marketing and advertising. And so if there's a marketing and advertising firm that's providing services to a plant touching 
client and that plant touching client then uses those advertising and marketing materials that the agency created and then experiences some adverse action from a regulatory agency, let's say for false advertising or uh, you know, Im improper labeling in some way, um, then I, what I would do to protect your client in here would be to, to put in something in the client's contract that says that it is ultimately up to the cannabis business's internal compliance officer to be the one to double check all of this marketing material to make sure that it doesn't violate anything. Um, in order, so I'd put the put the regulatory onus on the uh, on the licensed business and not your client that's providing yeah. the marketing. Materials. And ask for indemnity too. That's a great, you know. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. I would also uh, we've think a lot about force majeure clauses these days too. I would also throw in there something like, and by the way, if clients if the cannabis business gets shut down from some regulatory or federal criminal action, you still have to pay our bill. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think I don't see any other questions in the chat room and I see we are slightly over time, but if you would like to, um, to ask a question, you can probably get one, one more in now. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks for everyone for joining us and thanks Ian and Katie for all of your wisdom. Um, and, uh, we can turn it back over to Brian.